بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أعظم الله أجورنا وأجوركم من مصامنا أبي عبد الله الحسين We extend our deepest condolences to you our dear viewers, مؤمنين and مؤمنات from across the world the Shia of Ali ibn Abi Talib عليه السلام and indeed we extend our condolences on behalf of you all and us to our dear awaited Savior may Allah hasten his reappearance and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send his, be his peace and his blessings upon Aba Abdullah and upon his son Ali ibn al Hussein and upon the family of Hussein and upon the companions of Hussein. We ask for those peace and blessings of Allah to be sent to his brother, the standard brother Abu Fadl Abbas alayhi salam, to his dear sister Az Zainab al Kubra alayhi salam, the mother of tragedies, and to his dear daughter. Sakina bint Hussein alayhi salam in the dungeon of Sham where she passed away. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout for the service that we've tried to offer throughout these nights and the tears that we've shed with you during these nights for them to be accepted. And we mentioned that hadith from Ibn Rawa alayhi salam where he says that those tears abolish the greatest sins. And inshallah may they be a means of intercession for us dunya wa fil akhirah in this life and in the hereafter. Tonight, we remember the individual who held that group together. We remember that individual who held that religion together. We remember that individual who for us is a source of inspiration and guidance in so many different ways. We dedicate this night to him and to his absence after he left this world, to Aba Abdullah Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And we'll try to, whilst expressing the masaib to take a pause at different moments to see okay this masaib of Aba Abdullah what is it that we can take to us day to day inshallah and actually apply going forward to ensure this muharram as we've said many times now isn't just 10 days of mourning rather a year a 10 year a lifetime worth of change inshallah our poetry is delivered by our dear brother Ali Fadl assalamu alaikum alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah assalamu alaikum to the dear viewers as well uh, it's a heavy feeling, the, the night before Ashura, on the day of Ashura as well. It's, it's a very heavy feeling. It's, it's almost as if a, a, a weight is on the shoulders, mm. knowing and realizing that this is the moment in which Imam Hussain would be butchered on the sands of Karbala. It's, it's, it's not just because he is an Imam, not just because he is the son of Imam and not just because he is the grandson of, of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, upon which all of the Muslims unanimously stood behind mm. and upon which all of the Muslims unanimously saw how the Prophet would treat Imam Hussain and only 60 years passed between that and the butcher of Imam Hussain that this, this, this heavy feeling is because of the manner in which he was killed mm. the manner in which he would plead out to them and say to them what is what is what is wrong with you? Do you not realize who I am? Do you not realize who my family are? Do you not realize who my children are? And in the way that they were attacked and, and butchered, and not just it wasn't it was an issue of look, we need to kill you out of necessity. It was more of a hunger to kill mm, and revenge a, and, and a revenge. Yeah. And, in the, and there was there's a deep passion behind the killing and and uh, and and the beating of the children and the beating of the women and the burning of the tents. It's 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 not an issue of look, we need to take care of the situation in order to get into power. No, it's, it's, there, was, there was rage behind mm. it. And that's why it, it's a heavy feeling, remembering Imam Hussain on the day of Ashura. And to understand if Imam Hussain was, of course, to stand against oppression, something that we see day to day, something that we see in loads of different varieties of oppression. And it's something that if we attend the Majalis of Abu Abdullah, we are giving that promise and that vow that whenever we see this oppression, whatever type of oppression will be the ones to stand up against it and may Allah give us the tawfiq and the strength to be able to do this. But when we look at the stand of Aba Abdullah and we say, okay, I will stand with you against any oppression that I see in the world, it's important for us to identify these different types of oppression. Because sometimes it won't be as clear as a Yazid. Sometimes it won't be as clear as X, Y, and Z. Sometimes it's a lot more hidden. 
And it's important that we find it within us to recognize that is haq, that is batil. This is the truth, that's falsehood. That's where the oppression is and that's what I need to stand up against. And this oppression comes in different forms as we said, but what's scary is that sometimes we can actually be the oppressors ourselves. So whilst we're constantly searching for, is there oppression here or is there oppression there? Occasionally it's about getting a mirror out and saying, am I, well, a'udhu billah, the Yazid of this situation? Am I the oppressor in this situation? And if so, how would Imam Hussein view me? For he stood against any type of oppression. So how would he then view me if I was the oppressor? So to be more concrete, many different types of oppression, and if you just take three examples, political is the obvious one that comes to mind. Our stance against those who oppress Muslim or non-Muslim. Our dear Prophet ensured that everyone of different faiths was able to live together in harmony. So is it just that we look towards the oppression against Shias or just the oppression against Muslims? Or do we extend and say, no, we don't stand for any oppression against anyone, any unjust ruler. But political is always the clear one. And, you know, it's a question of are we reacting? But that's the very kind of factual and uh, easy one to see. When it starts to get a little bit more in depth and where it can start to actually hurt us a little bit, is if we look at social oppression, meaning what? Loads of different meanings of this, but one element, the way in which you take your community, if they're your social circle, for example, are you oppressing your community? Is there oppression going on within your community? Even more close knit, is there oppression occurring within your friendship circle? Is there someone in your friendship circle, maybe even a family member, who is oppressing someone? And this oppression can be as significant as saying he's holding this person ransom and is going to kill him, or to a much lesser extent, but still as bad to say this person is making person Z feel very, very ill of themselves, or making person Y feel very vulnerable, or make person X feel extremely saddened about this certain situation. This is all different types of oppression. And the question is, if we sit in this majlis of Aba Abdullah, are we actually standing against such types of oppression? Or are we partnering with it? Or are we the instigator of it? For if we're partnering or instigating it, then how will Imam salam look upon to us? And that's a very, very scary thought. Social oppression. There's political, there's social, but there's a third one that we want to look at, which is personal oppression as well. The oppression against your own soul. You have these daily fights with your soul. Should I do this? Should I do that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives everyone a soul, pure, clean, blank canvas. And now it's up to you how you want to play with it. Do you want to feed it with love of Ali Muhammad and mercy of Allah? Or do you want to feel it, feed it with gunj and oppression and animosity and jealousy and backbiting and etc. etc. Cancers of the soul as they're known as. That in itself is oppression. Allah's given you something and you're just trashing it to one side. So can you take the inspiration of Aba Abdullah, the stand against the oppressive ruler and regime and apply it to today? Because if not, the message is really lost. The beat of the chest is almost meaningless if you're not going to do anything. If you're not going to stand up against that person, if you're not going to stand up against your nafs and to say, actually, let me detach and remove. And as we've said in this general theme over these past 10 nights has been, am I now able to remove and say, forget it. Materialisticness and dunya is here. Submission to Allah is here. And that's where I'm going. Is it an addiction that's oppressing you? And if so, what is your Husseini mission to fight against it? Have you battle planned? It's not going to happen overnight. If you have an addiction, if you have something that is tainting your soul, it's not going to happen by just saying, Bismillah, I make my intention, that's it, I'm going to try and solve it. It needs a battle plan. It needs something concrete. It needs for you to sit down and write, okay, this is the problem I face. This is where I need to get to. These are the steps that I'm going to take. That's standing up to the, against oppression that you've inflicted upon yourself. 
So the lesson is very simple. Take this notion of standing up against oppression further. Don't just see it as a political thing. Or don't just see it as a Hussein versus Yazid thing. See it as a truth versus falsehood. See it as your own self in your own cir social circles. And if you can identify yourself as an oppressor in whatever format it may be, reflect but act fast. Reflect and act fast. Because we never know when our day is numbered, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, that's it, to, to, you, to me you belong to and to me you will return. You never know when that moment's coming. There is a hadith from Imam Sadiq salam where he talks about the oppression upon Ali Muhammad and upon those, inshallah, us who grieve for them. And he says, the breath of the one who is saddened on our account and is grieved for the oppression done unto us is glorification. The breath is glorification. And his grief for our cause is worship. Grief for the cause of Ali Muhammad, for the oppression against Ali Muhammad, Imam al-Sadiq says, is worship, is ibadah. Don't take it lightly. Don't take the azad lightly. Don't take the rituals lightly. This is worship. But it's worship if we understand why, and we've said this many times, it's because you are reviving that message of Hussein ibn Ali. You're reviving the message of Hussein, the grandson of the Prophet. You're reviving their message, which is a message that is very simple. And that is the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his perfect religion. So inshallah, we are able to be amongst those who revere the personality of Hussein more so than just a surface level. And we can be amongst those as Imam Sayyid that says, who side against those who oppress them and grieve for those who were oppressed Ahlul Bayt alayhim wasalam. When we see on the day of Ashura, Imam Hussein alayhi salam, at that point facing up to oppression and he takes his family and he's there at this point once all of his companions are gone once all of his family are gone and he makes that call of he's, he's calling as we said he's calling is there absolutely anyone but knowing that now is his time to walk towards his fate to walk towards this moment that the angels that the jinn that everyone knew was going to come and everyone knew that everyone was going to weep and cry upon this moment when Abu Abdullah al Hussein would go and fight for the cause of Islam. And this is the tragedy of Abu Abdullah. Abu Abdullah al Hussein, you mentioned that you know, when you are inflicting oppression on yourself, you need to identify what it is and how to take steps to overcome that. So within poetry as well, especially within this poem, automatically you refer back you, you refer back to Imam Hussein when it comes to really Reviving your, reviving yourself, developing yourself, seeing that inspiration within yourself, you'll go to Imam Hussain alayhi salam because it's because the it's such an emotional uh, story, an emotional event. Crying, weeping increases that likelihood mm. of being able to be inspired or opening up your heart to be inspired to do the change. And so, in the poem, it says, "Worlds apart, I search for the road." From me to you, O Hussein, what veils and what worlds exist between myself and Hussein? Can one who the heart has stolen, referring to Imam Hussein, السلام, can one who the heart has stolen be worlds apart from his servant? Can one who the heart has oh, stolen be worlds apart from his servant? Worlds apart, I search for the road. From me to you, oh, Hussein. What veils and what wells exist between myself and Hussein? Can one who the heart has stolen be worlds apart from his servant? Can one who the heart has stolen be worlds apart from his servant? He who wanders the world of love I stand alone at this world's end 
my eye searches for your figure so to your words I can attend and yet still worlds apart I stand even if worlds your love transcends I wish when you stood there alone my hand to you I could extend is it fair that I can't soothe you is it fair that I can't soothe you yet to all of my wounds you tend I wish when swords upon you pray that my master I could defend I stand on the edge of one world crying out your name Hussein and my tears that drip down reshape to write your name oh, Hussein can he whose love destroys reason be worlds apart from his servant the poet says is it fair that time can stand still when I'm entranced by your mention yet it won't go back centuries to days of your tribulation is it fair that you come to me is it fair that you come to me in each hopeless situation but I cannot return to you when left you there a whole nation and you stood there amongst the dead Hussein, you stood there amongst the dead in your eyes but death's reflection drawn in your eye the tears that saw on Hussein the world's desertion tell me how the eye that sees this notices me O Hussein how does the man that walks with death seek life in me O Hussein can he who his love time strengthen be worlds apart from his servants can he who his love time strengthen be worlds apart from his servants though time draws us further apart fire is in me you've created so when my mind recalls your day i feel your pain on me waiting i see your day as clear as day within my eye illustrated i weep upon my hand my tears tears and images they've painted as clear as as clear as i can see this hand on it with horrors i'm greeted i see fire chase tent to tent and how your daughters are treated no it's not just your eye that saw these tragedies oh, say, millions witness your day and weep beside you oh say, can he who gives many vision be worlds apart from his servant I live in dreams with such deep love some dreams all I see is beauty others my heart stops in its tracks and my eyes see calamity 
I live in dreams with such deep love. Some dreams, all I see is beauty. Others, my heart stops in its tracks and my eyes see calamity. They see the sun on the sky perched. They see the sun on the sky perched as it taunts young tongues so thirsty. They see arrows thirsty for blood and swords see death as a bounty. Indeed, I'm taunted by your love. Indeed, I'm taunted by your love. It can shape the heart as mighty, yet it can tear that same heart apart and make me break down a man empty. What love that gives the heart joy, yet makes the eye weep for Hussein. What love that gives the heart joy, yet makes the eye weep for Hussein, and yet both in smiles and cries, all it calls for is Hussein. Can the cause of such emotion be worlds apart from his servant? I'll mention one last verse, inshallah will carry on. When veils between worlds are lifted, when veils between worlds are lifted, will you hear me cry out your name? Will you search for the voice that calls for its beloved and burning flame? Will you forget that your suffering, a soul for this voice it became? So that each time it sought good deeds, your message it longed to inflame. Will you recall those who served you? Will you recall those who served you? Is that not why to us you came? Oh, he who needs servants, please know. Oh, he who needs servants, please know. My need for you is just the same. My need for you is just the same. When we are judged, will you hear the voice that cries out, Oh, Hussein? What is judgment if we are not rescued by you, Ya Hussein? Can he who holds such a burden be worlds apart from his servant? And many thanks, of course, um, to Nuri Sardaf. May Imam Al Hussein on that day of judgment, inshallah, be an intercessor for us, inshallah. inshallah. May his mother, may his mother, Az Zahra, salamullahi alayha, be an interceder for us on that day, inshallah, as well. One of the elements that we take from Imam Al Hussein salam, that perhaps we overlook in the Masaib because of the emotion that we're in, in terms of we, we recognize it, but we don't really draw anything from it because we're in such an emotional height at that point, is this. At that time when Imam Hussein eventually is going out himself to the battlefield, we need to understand the context and rationalize the context that is actually there for him. We've all had a dear one to us pass away, be it a grandparent, uh, a sibling, our parents, whoever. We've all had at least one experience or seen the experience of someone who has gone through this. And we've seen the torment that they go through, for, especially from that time where the person has passed away up until the person is buried, those hours are, they're frantic, they're almost scary, you know, the feelings are just, we've all been there, I don't need to explain it. And the point where that all ends, or tends to start to have closure, is the moment when they're buried. And of course, we then try and rationalise what happens, Imam Hussain saying this point, the state of mind and the control and the discipline he needed. Mm. It's almost like, when we say we go to an exam and we need control and discipline and focus, this exam, this imtihan was a different level, a different level. Imagine the focus he needed, despite the fact that he was having to fight against his emotions of knowing that all of his ashab are now dead and all of those family members that could fight are dead and all unburied except his dear son, Abdullah al who he himself buried. So that closure hasn't come to him yet. So the grief that he is at at this point is unimaginable. No one on the face of the earth will ever have to repeat that level of grief, full stop. Yet he's having to focus. There's focus, but then there's actually an element of, okay, perhaps he was actually lonely at this point. Perhaps this man stood in a land that he was not from, he didn't live in, he was a traveller in this land. 
he's now in this area, far, far from home. And usually when the tragedy befalls upon you, the, the one place that you have solace is when you go back into your home and you can let down your steam, as the phrase mm. is, be it, you know, lie in bed and relax and just reflect for a moment or on the couch or whatever, you're in your comfort zone. He's out of his comfort zone to a completely different level. Mm. How does he deal with it? How does he have that control? That level of loneliness that he must have felt at that point is unimaginable. So the question is, how, how did he overcome this loneliness? And how can we overcome loneliness ourselves when we hit that point where something so dramatic has happened? How do we ensure we have that same focus that Aba Abdullah had on that test and that exam that we then face? And it's a very subtle point. Like I said, we usually will overlook it in the Masai because it's so emotionally drawn, but there's a beautiful lesson to be found. And of course, the simple answer is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He found this company and this reassurance in Allah and only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the simple answer. But Imam Ali alayhi salam says something very beautiful about why it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that it is typically to him that we go to. And he says in this hadith, and it, it takes a few minutes, even hours and days to really kind of understand this. He says, when you fear the creator, you will escape to him. And when you fear a creature, you will escape from it. Mm. Look at the difference between the creator and the creation. If there's a creation and you're in fear of a creation, take a bee, there's a bee, there's a bee's nest, you're in fear of it, you run away from it, you escape from it. Yeah. But with the creator, you have a level of fear with the creator that you escape to it, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you have this inner sense of fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but the yaqeen as to why you fear him, you fear him because of his might, his power, the ability, the, the glory that he has. You fear Allah, but you run towards him because his mercy is more than the mercy of a mother. So where else would you run? Where else would Imam Hussein look towards when all of this tragedy is befallen around him and he has this mission to go on and he needs to focus and be ready for what's about to come to ensure that intention is clean throughout the whole way? It's that he's got fear of Allah and Imam Ali says, when you fear the Creator, you will escape to him. So he was with Allah. He was going towards Allah. So similarly to us, if we can instill this sense of fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that moment when we stand in prayer and we look down, we're thinking actually what's looking bad at me, what's looking back at me right now is power and glory and might. And hence I submit. Hence I go to sajda and take the highest part of my body to the lowest part. And I submit and by submitting I'm saying Allah I fear you but I come to you. And Allah in that time of test that you give me just like Abba Abdullah, I will hold my fear but I'll know that I come towards you and that you will help me in that moment. And it's this masa'ib of Imam Hussein alayhi salam where how he managed to overcome that sight of Ali and al-Akbar, how he was able to overcome the loss of Abu Fadl and hold him in his lap, how he was able to overcome the arrow in the neck of Abdullah al Rabi, how he was able to overcome, and this was the test even more so that when he is being killed, he's still having to look back towards the camp because he knows what these men are about to go and do to his own daughter and sisters. The Masai of Imam Hussein just doesn't end. Yes, he's now elevated, his soul is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But he's looking back, he's seeing Zainab alayhi salam looking on. He's seeing Sayyid al-Ruqayya alayhi salam within the tent and thinking, I'm going to have to, right now, just, I can't do anything. And what was it that he was able to do? Have tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what got him through. And we ask Allah for us to seek inspiration from that moment when He gives us our tests. When He gives us our tests, that we have this inherent fear of Allah and hence we go towards Him as per the hadith of Imam Ali alayhi salam. The masa'ib of Imam Hussain alayhi salam is where do you start, where do you end? 
But I want to take an angle um, from Sayyida Zainab السلام, in the sense that we mentioned a couple of nights ago that she saw why they call her the mother of tragedies because right from the beginning of her life all up until the, till, till the end she saw every single direct family member um, either be butchered uh, on a foreign lands or struck on the head or poisoned or a door was closed on, on, on her mother or her rib broken there's every single type of Messiah, but the, every, for me, everything culminated in one event, one little scene right before Imam Hussein was, was, was to, to go out towards the battlefield. He first said his farewells to the women and children. Get up, he gets up onto his horse, grabs his shield, grabs his sword, just about um, to go out. He's already said his farewell at this point in time. He's already said his farewell, and the women and children are, are, are crying for him to return. But Sayyidina Zainab is standing firm and patient. And as he rides up, as he starts to ride away, she calls out to him one more time. She says, Oh Hussein, oh Hussein, come back to me, come back to me. There is one thing I have to, I have to tell you. And in this is, is the scene which everything that she went through culminated in one scene, which, which really represented what she was for me. He says, he comes down from the horse, he says, Look, I've already said my farewell and I'm already heartbroken and it's a situation which is difficult for me and I have to go right out towards my fate. What is it, O oh, Sister Zainab? She says, I have a request from Fatima to Zahra, السلام, our mother. Allahu Akbar. And our mother has told us that there will be a day on a foreign land where your brother Hussein السلام, is going to be alone and he will say, Hal min nasrin yansurna? And then he will ride out towards his fate. On that day, on that moment, you bring him back and you fulfill this request which I'm telling you now. And she held on to this request. She didn't tell anyone about it up until she saw that Imam al Hussein was on the lands of Karbala, was alone, had already mentioned Hal min Nasr and Yansurana, was about to ride out towards his fate. What was the request, O oh, sister Zainab, that I kiss you by the neck Allah. and I kiss you by the chest? For she knew that Imam Hussain his chest will be trampled by the, by the horses and his neck will be severed by Shimr. And so in the poem, I'm going to refer back to Fatim Zahra السلام, as she comes back to see the massacre in front of her and what happened to her. Um, dear children in the, lands, in the lands of Karbala. And she says, There is no day like your day, O oh Hussein. There is no day like your day, O oh Hussein. came from heavens looking for my son I found you alone by you stood no one I found you in blood burnt beneath the sun left here in your thirst son what has been done oh my grandfather your Hussein was massacred lonely I stood alone holding the flag of your Islam proudly the blood of my neck couldn't quench my thirst I died thirsty Left crushed beneath horses My grandfather is mighty There is no day like your day oh, 
تسو ايو من تسو كتها حجاب وان هاند اون هيس جست وان هاند اون هرب شي كريدلز يو ناو شي وانس سويد يو كريب اي فيلد لايونس Defending her cup Mother, my flowing blood Apologizes to your scent I watch the pupils in your eyes explode As they lament the pain of my shattered ribs recalls your rib that was burnt Mother, your pain is your past but my pain is my present There is no like your day, oh Hussein. I see a lion, that's all lions fear Rise up from Najaf in his eye He greets his beloved head on a spear the wails of Ali Hussein's head would hear the wails of Ali Hussein's head would hear Oh Father Ali whose presence makes the universe sway you But so should my death be this way I saw the sun shrivel up and I saw stars fall today Ali replies, oh my son, there is no day like your day There is no day like your day, oh Hussein Thanks to the Nuri one of the things that really is just very difficult to comprehend is that despite all of the tragedies that took place in Karbala, despite all of the tragedies that took place in Karbala, when it asked, when Imam Sajjad was asked what was the most difficult mm. part, his response is not Karbala. His response is not, it was the moment when my father was beheaded. His response wasn't, it's when Abdullah al-Radiya had the arrow in his neck. His response wasn't when Imam Hussein had his own khaybar to deal with, with the spear of Ali and al-Akbar. His response wasn't the thirst of the children. His response wasn't the iron mace upon Abu Fadl and the fall of Abu Fadl and the fall of the flag of Islam at that moment. His response wasn't the burning sand, his response wasn't all of these tragedies combined and having to deal with the burning tents. His response wasn't even the moment when an orphan child had her earrings ripped from her ears. His response wasn't any of that. His response wasn't even putting all of those elements together. His response was one word, a sharp. Oh. Despite all of that, he says the toughest part was sharp. Oh. And I think that speech speaks enough for itself into the difficulty Ali Muhammad then had to go through after that moment. 
the masaib of Ahlul Bayt alayhim wa salam. Imagine, it doesn't even end there. It continues, it continues, it continues. And it doesn't even get, it gets tougher and tougher and tougher. Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam says, <coughs> it said that he used to cry over his father, Hussein ibn Ali, for 20 or 40 years. And whenever food was brought to him, <coughs> he would cry over Hussein alayhi salam. And then one day his servant said to him, May I sacrifice myself for you, O son of the Messenger of Allah? I am afraid that you will die from your grief. And Imam Sajjad replies and he says, I only complain of my distress and grief to Allah. And I know from Allah what you do not know. Verily, when I remember the killing of the children of Fatima, I am choked. I am choked with tears over them. The words of Imam Sajjad salam reflecting on Karbala. The dust, the dust settled, settled burnt, burnt out by a tear. tear. Through its Through ashes, ashes the, the eyes of, of death peer. Cries, cries that break, break bone, bone, the dead wood. Cries, cries that break bone, bone the dead wind would hear. Would hear. As Hussein's head is raised on a spear, no hands comfort gone are all held dear. By Zainab, no Abbas would appear. By Zainab, no Abbas would appear. Over 72 dead bathed by the blood that was shed Painted in dust that turned red As away captives are led As away captives are led We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept this little from us insha'Allah We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the intercession of Ali Muhammad for dunya wal akhirah, we ask Allah subhanahu wa taala to allow us to be amongst those who avenge the death, the, to avenge the death of Abu Abdullah and the blood that was spilt in Karbala. Our dear viewers, we hope and pray that you have benefited from these ten nights of shows. And if there was anything untoward that either of us have said, please forgive us for this was never our intention. Any good that you benefited came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And finally, we end with this, <coughs> and that is, once this Muharram finishes, once the day of Ashura comes to an end, know that is when your Ashura begins. Know this is when your test begins. Ensure this is a vaccination for you that is going to be with you for five to ten years and renew it as regularly as you can. Ensure that you do not forget the 30th to the 40th where we remember Ashra Zainabiyya for that in itself, as Imam Sajjad says, was the toughest time. Ensure you commemorate that and inshaAllah we ask Allah to accept all of our efforts in His way. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.